this topic with the same combination of scholarship and sensitivity and wisdom and care and thought that Ian undoubtedly brings to what he does. Of course, it's absolutely essential that we do tackle subjects that we would far rather avoid. We must look at this sad, tragic, horrible episode in human history. We must safeguard a spirit of free and open inquiry. We must be prepared to be challenged and to be shocked and to think deeply. And if we are Christians who believe that the whole human race and the whole world belongs to God, we should be at the forefront of that kind of spirit. So, um, Ian will speak in two halves. There'll be an interval halfway through. Each half will be about 35 minutes or so, is that what we've agreed? Um, it will all be here on this PowerPoint. Uh, I am hoping that a little later on we'll be able to record most of tonight, but maybe not all of tonight, and I apologize if we can't record all of it. Um, but, uh, but you're here, and, uh, and that, is, that is the best place to be. Uh, there will be a time at the end as well, of course, for questions and answers. So please, uh, please uh, have those questions ready uh, when, you, uh, when we come to the end. So, Ian, do come up and um, come and speak to us about this subject, and we look forward, and we are very grateful to you for, for joining us this evening. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, privilege of the invitation to speak here this evening. In the first part of the evening, I'm mainly going to talk about the history of slavery insofar as it involved and, uh, and had a bearing on the work of churches and of Christians. And then after the break, I'm going to try to um, be as helpful as I can. It's not easy, but to be as helpful as I can by saying, um, what do we learn from this? What questions does this raise for us um, today? So, um, in June 2020, the statue of a man called Edward Colston was toppled into the harbour in Bristol. There's a photograph there if you can see it. He, he lived from 1636 to 1721 and was involved towards the end of his life with what was called the Royal African Company. And in the 12 years that he was involved in heading that company, it is estimated that the company transported over 84,000 African men, women, and children to the Caribbean. The present mayor of Bristol, Marvin Rees, who is black and the son of a Jamaican migrant, said in an interview with the BBC that while he did not condone the protesters' actions, he understood them. Charles, when still Prince of Wales, said this, I cannot describe the depth of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. Then Justin Welby, Archbishop of Canterbury, this abominable trade took men, women and children created in God's image and stripped them of their dignity and freedom. The fact that some within the church actively supported and profited from it is a source of shame. It is only by facing this painful reality that we can take steps towards genuine healing and reconciliation, the path that Jesus Christ calls us to walk. Before I get really into the talk, I need to say what I'm not doing this evening. Um, I'm not going to deal with how Christians interpret the Bible in relation to slavery. 
only insofar as I will say something about how the people in the past applied the Bible. Secondly, I'm not giving a a general history of slavery and the slave trade. That would be a far bigger thing. Nor am I going to try to speak about modern-day slavery or of human trafficking. And although colonialism is in the title, um, I'm only going to be able to touch on that. But I am hoping that we can see that thinking Christianly about our past helps us to live consistently as Christians in the present and has something to say to those who may not be Christians. Also by way of introduction, we need to be careful about how we speak and talk. This evening we're going to hear people speaking in the language of their day. Words which we today will find hurtful, they did not always have the exact kind of associations that they do today, but um, we will hear people talking about blacks, heathen, natives, mulatto. Here is a quotation from a man who was a Baptist minister, and he's speaking in 1789. And I quote this to show that we are not the first people to be sensitive to language. Some interested person perhaps will reply, they are only Negroes destined to slavery by divine appointment. Sadly, there were people, as we will see, said exactly that. Negroes, what do you mean by the term? You intend it, I imagine, as a term of degradation, if not infamy. You would, by this invidious appellation, cut the link of brotherhood and have it thought that the blood of such men is not congenial with your own. Alas, alas. And we have to be careful how we speak because there have been important, indeed profound differences um, between and among Christians. And we will encounter these and they may sadden us. They will sadden us. Um, sorry, I just flicked over something. The, the, uh, the Law Society, uh, I have not put a, um, a link on here, but the Law Society has a very helpful site uh, about the language that we use about this whole area. It's a very helpful site. So where are we going? Um, I'll say a little bit uh, about the history of slavery and the trade and what the, it was like to experience slavery. And then I'll talk about the movement in Britain against the slave trade and slavery. And I'll particularly talk about the Christian response from the 17th to the 19th century in Britain and America. And then um, I will want to say something about what was the argument, on what grounds did Christians um, in the 18th century in particular, late 18th century, how, what, how did they think about this in their argument against it? Um, what were their arguments uh, against slavery? Um, how, how did they see the relationship between slavery and what happened to the Christian faith? Um, and then what did they say uh, when they talked about national sin and national judgment? And then after the break, as I've said, I'll try to speak about five or six questions that this raises for us. Um, You should have got a a reading list uh, um, and uh, it's not homework but um, um, and I think hopefully you can see that uh, um, that there's a a light highlighting of of several um, sources which uh, I think are are helpful as, uh, as starters. One man said this in a book on the history of Africa. In 1492, there fell upon Africa the curse of Christopher Columbus, and a mighty curse it proved to be. There developed the triangular slave trade. 
ships from Bristol, Liverpool, took goods to the West African coast, purchased slaves, took the slaves across to the Caribbean, brought back to the UK sugar and cotton. Let's quote another, another quote from this man. A process of forced migration larger than any other in history. The human record knows no combination more grimly contradictory. The piling up of wealth in one side, but the misery of mass enslavement on the other. There were great cities that scrambled into wealth. Bristol, Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham. 1798, this is William Haig speaking in his biography of William Wilberforce. 1798 alone saw 150 ships leave the port of Liverpool bound for Africa, the highest ever recorded in one year. And in 1783, 15 years previously, the then Prime Minister, William Pitt, estimated that the slave trade profits accounted for 80% of British overseas income, 80%. Um, you won't be able to see that diagram, but it's a, a famous um, um, description picture um, of a slave ship with bodies packed parallel um, in chains um, across, the, across the ship. What happened um, on the west coast of uh, Africa? Well, um, people were marched to the coast by um, people from the interior um, and good and sound Africans were marked in the breast with a red-hot iron, the mark of ownership. John Newton, writing in his Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade, you might know John Newton himself uh, was captain of a slave trading ship early in his life. He writes this later on. They are all put in irons in most ships, two and two together. Thus they must sit, walk and lie for many months, sometimes nine or ten, without any mitigation or relief unless they are sick. He recalled, I have seen them sentenced to unmerciful whippings, continued till the poor creatures have not had power to groan under their misery, and hardly a sign of life has remained. I've seen them agonizing for hours. I believe for days together, under the torture of the thumbscrews, a dreadful engine, which, if the screw be turned by an unrelenting hand, can give intolerable anguish. On arrival in uh, the islands, uh, William Haig says uh, um, there are ships, he's quoting John Newton, so, uh, um, uh, uh, there are ships full of these wretches who are exposed there stark naked and bought like cattle. Kin were separated, uh, John Newton said much later on giving evidence in the house, to the House of Commons, probably to meet no more. There's a question uh, uh, in um, there's a report to Parliament in, in, in 1790 um, and a witness was um, asked um, what is the legal power which masters have over their slaves in each of the British islands in the West Indies? He said this a master of bloody mindedness or cruel intention willfully killing his slave is to pay 15 pence into the public treasury under the 19th clause of the relevant act. Accepting this, his power is absolute, for if a slave under punishment by his master's order suffers in life or member, the master under the same clause is liable to no fine whatever. Frederick Douglass was um, a, uh, uh, probably one of the most uh, famous freed slaves um, uh, and uh, um, I should say, you know, the other handout you have is, uh, uh, there's uh, um, 
in the last 20 years, people have brought together narratives that were um, given by freed slaves. Um, and uh, the one I've given you um, is the very first um, narrative that came out, um, and uh, little known, but I've given you that one. I'm not going to read it at all. It's there for you. But Frederick Douglass um, said, talking this about how uh, professed faith could coexist with great cruelty. In August 1832, my master attended a Methodist camp meeting and there experienced religion. I indulged a faint hope that his conversion would lead him to emancipate his slaves and that if he did not do this, it would at any rate make him more kind and humane. I was disappointed in both these respects. It neither made him to be humane to his slaves nor to emancipate them. If it had any effect on its character, it made him more cruel and hateful in all his ways, for I believe him to have been a much worse man after his conversion than before. John Wesley said, speaking of the law in Virginia, such is the manner wherein the Negroes are procured. Thus the Christians preach the gospel to the heathens. Uh, this is uh, the cover of the uh, book of slave narratives, I was born a slave. Um, I'll, I'll touch on the um, book on the right hand side in the second talk. Um, so there's just a reference there to, um, to slave narratives and there. Um, it was in 1788 that John Newton wrote his thoughts upon the African slave trade, which he sent to every member of Parliament. I was asked by a good Christian friend of African heritage whether I thought Newton ever expressed contrition. Well, you have to make your judgment about this. Newton said this, The reader may perhaps wonder, as I do now myself, that knowing the state of this biotraffic to be as I have described, and abounding with enormities which I haven't mentioned, I did not at the time start with horror at my own employment as an agent of promoting it. He says, custom, example and interest have blinded my eyes. I did it ignorantly, for I'm sure had I thought of the slave trade then as I've thought of it since, no consideration would have induced me to do it. Uh, as a, also part of that picture, the ship there, which you perhaps may be able to get a better impression of there. Uh, perhaps what I've said of myself may be applicable to the nation at large. The slave trade was always unjustifiable, but inattention and interest prevented for a time the evil being perceived. It is otherwise at present. I hope it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. William Wilberforce is perhaps the best known name in this country in relation to slavery. And there was that time, not long after he had become a Christian, he was a member of parliament uh, some time before he was a Christian. And uh, in 1787, he records this. God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. Reformation of manners doesn't mean how you hold your knife and fork. It means, uh, it means the reformation of behavior. Um, and uh, it would prove, uh, uh, William Haig says, in his absolutely outstanding biography of Wilberforce, uh, one of the most protracted and demanding political and parliamentary struggles in the whole of British history. Um, he, he gave his maiden speech in May 1789. His maiden speech was three and a half hours. His maiden speech in Parliament. This is how he ended his speech. Having heard all of this, you may choose to look the other way, but you may never again say that you did not know. In 1792, following a major setback in that year, a whole succession of setbacks actually, he could write, by God's grace I will persevere with more earnestness than ever, laboring to work out my own salvation in an entire and habitual dependence upon him, upon God. He initiated bills in 1793, 1795, 1796, 1797, 1798, 1799. They were all defeated. 
Newton wrote to Wilberforce in 1796. I like this. You are not only a representative from Yorkshire, uh, parliamentary representative, you have the far greater honour of being a representative for the Lord in a place where many know him not. I may say to you as Darius to Daniel in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, thy God whom thou servest continually is able to preserve and deliver you. John Wesley said to him, um, unless God, uh, right near the end of John Wesley's life, that's a statue of Wesley, um, unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils, but if God be for you, who can be against you? The foreign slave bill, as it was called, was carried through both houses eventually in 1807. Despite Lord Nelson, British hero though he is, condemning, quote, the damnable doctrine of Wilberforce and his hypocritical allies. And then, of course, that didn't bring slavery to the end. It ended the slave trade, but not slavery itself. Uh, and uh, the, the campaign against slavery itself gained force again in the 1820s. And in 1823, Wilberforce wrote an appeal. Uh, that's, uh, not, that's just the first word of the title. He, he, he put this verse from the book of Jeremiah there at the beginning. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work. Slavery was abolished in most British colonies in 1833, days before Wilberforce died on the 29th of July. Uh, that man on the right is William Gladstone in his youth. Um, and uh, he, he, he was 23 at that time, no friend of abolition. A great prime minister, I, I think the greatest prime minister Britain has ever had. Um, but he was no friend of abolition at this time. He met with Wilberforce. This is what he recorded. Went to breakfast with old Mr. Wilberforce. Heard him pray with his family. Blessing and honour are upon his head. What should we make of Wilberforce? That's him. Well, the Reformation of Manners bit in 1797, he brought out his practical view of the prevailing religious system of professed Christians contrasted with real Christianity. In those days, they didn't go for short book titles, and this, by standards of those days, is really brief, I can tell you. Um, but this, what, what's he, what does he say in this? There is no point in being a Christian without taking it seriously. Quote, let not your precious time be wasted in shapeless idleness. Oops, sorry, press the... Um, yeah, um, so it's not a longer quote from William Hay, but, but forgive me if I, I read it, it's, it's very helpful. The parliamentary campaign against the slave trade required the most, a most unusual combination of qualities in its leader, a thirst for truth, an ability to win allies across the political spectrum, a refusal to accept defeat so strong as to be an inability to do so, a command of parliamentary oratory, an understanding of how to anchor detailed and practical arguments in the context of great moral course, uh, force, and in the pursuit of abolition, this was precisely the combination of abilities that William Wilberforce brought to bear. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the minister um, right, um, speaking um, uh, half a century later, it was God that gave Wilberforce and raised him up to plead in Parliament the rights of men. Well, okay, quickly then something about the Christian response. I want to say just very briefly something about the Puritans in the 17th century. Um, and uh, certainly they denounced what they called man-stealing. That was quite clear. Um, a man called Samuel Rutherford, Scottish, very important Scottish, uh, uh, um, a theologian wrote a, a famous book, Lex Rex, um, uh, on government. A man being created according to God's image, he is res sacra, a sacred thing, and can no more by nature's law be sold and bought than a religious and sacred thing 
dedicated to God. There's a man called Richard Baxter wrote a Christian directory, 1673, to catch up poor Negroes or people of another land that never forfeited life or liberty and to make them slaves and sell them is one of the worst kinds of thefts in the world. And they that buy them and use them as beasts for their mere commodity and betray or destroy or neglect their souls are fitter to be called incarnate devils than Christians. Didn't mince his words. Um, There's an American Puritan uh, uh, a man called Cotton Mather um, wrote a, 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 a tract called The Negro Christianized in which he made a similar kind of argument. Yet many Puritans at that time owned slaves. Uh, this man uh, I'm quoting here says, American guy, in hindsight we groan over the many years that black slaves had to wait before Christians woke up to a consistent application of their theological principles. Our nation, uh, the states, continues to suffer the tragic consequences of this blindness. But we must not reject the theology of the Puritans or the Puritans themselves for their slowness and tunnel vision in this matter. We do well if we could follow them insofar as they followed Christ. And then uh, another important figure in America, a man called Jonathan Edwards, and many of you will know of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards owned, bought, and sold slaves. Sorry, I'm going to click it several times before it moves. Um, very interestingly, uh, only uh, 26 years ago, a letter, a draft letter was discovered, written by Edwards to a minister who appears to have been facing criticism for his position on slavery. Uh, so, somebody, an American guy who I've had, I've had some email contact with, uh, commenting on what we can conclude from this letter is that though he himself, Edwards, owned slaves, he did not wholeheartedly defend slavery. Rather, his letter acknowledged its inequities and disturbing implications. At the same time, however, Edwards felt that slavery was a necessary evil that served some um, positive good in the natural order that God had decreed. There'll be some people at that stage used to say, oh, if you enslave black people, you bring them under the influence of Christianity and they may become Christians. Um, that was an argument. Edward said, this is a nonsense. It's not a, what he called a, a converting ordinance um, that, that would be a means of uh, people becoming um, Christians. And his, his congregation received the black people into full membership of the church, giving them all the privileges of membership, including access to baptism and the Lord's Supper. And towards the end of his life, he died quite young, he would become a missionary to the Mahican Indians in the town of Stockbridge. And the written records um, seem to indicate that he treated the Mahicans with great compassion, educating them through literacy and even calling them my people. Thirdly, a man called George Whitfield. Again, many of you will know. This is Charles Spurgeon again speaking um, um, towards the end of the 19th century about Whitfield. Even in the saints there remains the old nature. Even they are not altogether free from the darkening power of sin. For I do not hesitate to see that we, that we all unwittingly allow ourselves um, in practices which clearer light would show to be sins. Even the best of men have done this in the past. He's actually specifically talking about Whitfield. And it's a strange position Whitfield got himself into. Early, it was in America at the time, he spoke out very strongly against, particularly against harsh treatment. He warned callous slave owners, go to now, he's quoting the Bible to them, go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. But he himself later sanctioned the use of slave labor at his orphanage in Georgia. That's a ground plan of his orphanage. And in 1751, he went as far as this. As for the lawfulness of keeping slaves, I have no doubt. It is plain to a demonstration that hot countries cannot be cultivated without Negroes. And then, fourthly, I want to say something um, about the 19th century and America. And 
uh, the, the, the South. Uh, and uh, what was said by some um, theologians whose works have been reprinted and are respected, published today. Um, well, they were certainly united in accepting that the African-American population were people created in the image of God. Depend upon it, it's no light matter to deny the common brotherhood of humanity. If the African is not of the same blood with ourselves, he has no lot nor part in the gospel. A man called James Thornwell, that's him. Another man, uh, Robert Dabney, said, it, it need hardly be said we abhor the injustice, cruelty and guilt of the African slave trade. We tend to think today, we lump together slavery and the slave trade. We just think that it's the same question. It, historically, it simply wasn't. We've already seen how the slave trade was abolished in this country in 1807, but not uh, um, until 1833 was slavery abolished. So quite distinct. Um, Although they said this, we read statements we could wish had never been uttered. Um, a man called James Thornwell again says this, Providence has given us slavery. Like every human arrangement, it's liable to abuse, but in its idea and in its ultimate influence upon the social system, it is wise and beneficent. We see in it a security for the rights of property and a safeguard against pauperism and idleness. And if you know British social history, it's a very similar argument that was used for developing what was called the poor law in the UK. A man called um, Benjamin Palmer, that's him. Um, he talks about, he says, what if there is a nation that has a God-given trust which he believed the South had, not the North, the South in America. If then the South is such a people, what at this juncture is their providential trust? I answer that it is to conserve and perpetuate the institution of domestic slavery as now existing. Um, Palmer continued, I find it difficult even to read these words. Of the black race, he said, every attribute of their character fits them for dependence and servitude. And left to their own devices, quote, their constitutional indolence has converted the most beautiful islands of the sea into a howling waste. Robert Dabney, it is enough for us to say what is capable of overwhelming demonstration, that for the African race, um, such as Providence has made it, and where he has placed it in America, slavery was the righteous, the best, yea, the only tolerable relation. Um, now, cannot common sense see the moral advantage to such people of subjection to the race of to the will of a race elevated above them in morals and intelligence to an almost measureless degree was it nothing that this race morally inferior should be brought into close relations to a nobler race and then this man john girardeau i've lumped him with these people um, for the reasons i quote here he was quite different he, in many ways, a remarkable man. Uh, um, uh, uh, but nonetheless, he, he still maintained the superiority, superiority of the white um, community. And in his ministry, uh, um, he sustained, he reinforced ideas of racial hierarchy. He believed that Africans and African Americans were the sons of Ham. Those of you that know your Bible know Ham was one of the sons of Noah, upon whom a curse was um, uh, uh, given. Um, he also owned slaves and de defended the institution as a positive benefit. He also defended segregation in detail and at length in his churches. Sorry. Well, hopefully more encouraging. <laughs>
um, in the 18th century Britain. Uh, William Cooper, the um, poet and known today largely as a hymn writer, he, but he, in the 18th century he was one of the best known poets. He, he wrote several new poems against the slave trade, including one which was a biting satire, Pity the Poor Africans. He also one called the, the Negro's Complaint, he wrote one as well. I pity them greatly, but I must be mum, I must be quiet, silent. I pity them greatly, but I must be mum, for how could we do without sugar and rum, especially sugar, so needful we see, what, give up our desserts, our coffee and tea? William Carey, um, you perhaps know of William Carey, many of you. Uh, many persons have of late left off the use of West India sugar on account of the iniquitous manner in which it is obtained. Not only cleanse their hands of blood, but have made a saving to their families. Some of six months or part of this were appropriated to the uses before mentioned. He means a national committee raising money to campaign against the slave trade. That's the uses before mentioned. It would abundantly suffice. Well, what was their argument? Well, threefold. First, um, they were saying something about how a Christian should understand human nature. Um, um, there were some Baptist ministers particularly who were helpful in this. A man called John Dorr, a London minister. He perhaps had most to say on this theme. Um, he said, are not men naturally free? Is not liberty the gift of God to man? There are natural rights which belong to men as men and of which they ought not to be deprived. Uh, John Newton uh, um, he, he speaks about this most personally. So he challenged assumptions about ethnicity and human nature in ways which were central to the wider Christian response. He, he was giving evidence to the House of Commons in 1790. He was asked this question, what conclusion, looking back to when he was a slave trader, uh, what conclusions did you form respecting the capacity of the Negroes compared with that of other men in the same period in society? He said this, I always judged that with equal advantages they would be equal to ourselves in point of capacity. I have met with many instances of real and decided natural capacity among them. That sounds a straightforward thing to say today. That, in some ways, is a quite remarkable thing to be said in 1790. Secondly, uh, they believed that slavery actually harmed the Christian gospel. John Dorr again. The slave trade works against the fulfilment of gospel promises. Uh, John Beetson, who I quoted at the beginning about uh, the use of the term Negro, um, and, um, in closing a, a sermon of his, uh, linked it to the cause, the prosperity of the gospel. Can the gospel be recommended to the attention of men while you are thus buying and selling them as though they were brutes? William Carey recorded how the freeing of slaves, quote, may prove the happy means of introducing them to them, uh, among them, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. A man called John Rippon, another Baptist minister, he composed a song in prospect of the abolition of the slave trade. It was based on uh, 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 preaching, speaking on a verse from the Psalms. In March um, 1807, the year slave trade was abolished. The day has dawned, Jehovah comes to crush oppression's rod. Now Ethiopia soon shall stretch her hands to thee, O God. And then thirdly, they, they argued that God had winked at, turned a blind eye, we might say today, uh, to their past ignorance of the evils of slavery. And they interpreted the Bible to warn them that slavery as a national sin risked incurring God's national judgment. Um, that God had made of, one blood all, of, uh, had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, verse, was often quoted, and uh, a verse just after that, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I'm using the translation they were quoting from here, of course. Um, and they applied this to their times rather than immediately as, as was being applied um, in, in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, I, as Newton says, I did it ignorantly. Um, 
This was never at the expense of love for their country. I'll say a bit more about this in the second talk. Um, William Cooper wrote in his poem, The Task, England with all thy faults, I love thee still. But what did they mean when they talked about national sins and national judgment? Well, um, you see the cl clearest statement later in the sermons of Charles Spurgeon. In one of many, many examples in 1859, he said, there is a weighing time for kings and emperors. For nations, there is a weighing time. National sins demand national punishments. There is no God in heaven if the iniquity of slavery go unpunished. There is no God existing in heaven above if the cry of the Negro do not bring down a red hail of blood upon the nation that still holds the black man in slavery. America, he meant. It's uh, quite possible, uh, it's difficult to pin this down, that Spurgeon's sermons may have been publicly burned in the southern states <coughs> for saying things like this. Uh, the background uh, to this text you can see vaguely there is, is a text from a, um, a newspaper called the Montgomery Mail in Alabama, which was calling on people to bring all of Spurgeon's sermons to a certain place and time when they were all going to um, be set fire to. Spurgeon is developing an argument that the Baptists we've talked about had adopted. Um, so this man, John Beatson, again. Um, that, that's, no, sorry, that's somebody, sorry. Uh, Whenever a nation uses its superior wisdom, power, or wealth to break into their country to disturb its happiness, to destroy or carry off into captivity its unoffending inhabitants, and when they come into a foreign land to sell or use them as beasts of burden for life, such a conduct indeed appears to include in it every crime which one nation can be guilty of against another. Robert Robinson, uh, some of you, many of you will know the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, which he, he, he wrote, and that's Robert Robinson. If there be such a thing as national sin, I fear, I fear, the African slave trade is of this kind. John Newton said to Wilberforce, the slave trade is a millstone sufficient of itself to sink such an enlightened and highly favoured nation as ours to the bottom of the sea. Um, I just want to just say a couple of words about uh, uh, colonialism and empires because it, it belongs to this. This man, John Beatson, for the third quotation, he, he, he would wish to transmit the blessings we enjoy, civil and religious, not only to our immediate, but to our remote descendants. But he would do so only on the grounds that it, quote, should engage us to maintain rectitude and humanity in our conduct with all to whom our transactions extend. That's one of just um, many examples. It was on this basis that Christians thought about how we should understand God's well, this was God's temporal judgments, uh, national disasters and so on and so forth. And a man called James Montgomery, uh, uh, and despite writing after the slave trade had been made illegal, he, he was a, a poet. But also, we, uh, there are hymns by him in, in books today. <clears throat> um, just looking back a bit, uh, Britannia, she who scathed the crest of Spain and won the trident scepter of the main, Britannia shared the glory and the guilt by her were slavery's island altars built and fed with human victims, while the cries of blood demanding vengeance from the skies pierced her proud heart, too long in vain assailed. Isaac Watts wrote a paraphrase of Psalm 107. He never sing this. I'd, I'd be very interested if anybody ever heard of this. Um, he called this paraphrase, Colonies Planted or Nations Blessed and Punished, a psalm for New England. He has this couplet about what he calls Christian nations. Thus they are blessed, but if they sin, he lets the heathen nations in. Spurgeon, talking at the time of the Indian Rebellion in 1857. I believe that British rule there in India has been useful in many ways. I shall not deny the civilising influence of European society or that great things have been done for humanity, but I do assert and can prove it that there would have been greater probability of the gospel spreading in, in India if it had been left alone than there has been ever since the domination of Great Britain. 
a man called Thomas Chalmers, Scottish, uh, um, very important Christian leader. He criticised those uh, who wanted to excommunicate from their churches um, slaveholders. Um, and there's a correspondence uh, you can find about this. Charles Spurgeon again appears to have held a quite different position, saying, Although I commune at the Lord's table with men of all creeds, yet with a slaveholder I have no fellowship of any sort or kind. Well, I was going to finish there that uh, talk, and I'm going to come back to some of those issues, of course, after the break. Just like to acknowledge uh, thanks to two people Michael Haken, who's a professor of church history in the States. Marilyn Rouse, who, who runs here in uh, Kettering, what's called the John Newton Project. So, thank you very much. Uh, Ian, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, that, that is the, the first part. There'll be another part to come afterwards. There'll be a little break, you'll be glad to know, just to get up and stretch and have some refreshments in the, in the back hall. Uh, before you do that, let me just draw attention to the fact that um, there are some books over there for sale, uh, a book that Ian has written, not about this subject at all, but uh, a biography of a man called Leslie Land. Now, Leslie Land was minister of Melbourne Hall Church in, in Leicester, uh, where, where Ian is from, where Ian grew up. And uh, these books are, uh, there's wonderful endorsements of them by Ian Hamilton, Michael Hakin, Jonathan Catherwood, and, and others. Do take a look, uh, do pick one up, but pay for it. And the way to pay for it is by picking up the bit of paper that's with them and doing what it says on the paper, okay? Please don't steal them. We trust you, okay? I'll, I'll make sure that uh, what's gone and what Ian eventually collects is, is the same after this whole process is finished. But, um, <laughs> well, you've heard, he said that, not me. <laughs> okay, um, we'll try to come back here for about quarter to nine. Uh, do have a stretch of the legs, step outside if you want, but there's food and drink. Go through the back hall there. 